there, my name is Rosie Goldsmith and welcome to Rock Talks, our new conversation series featuring literary rock stars from both Romania and Britain. Tonight's live conversation with crime writers Ian Rankin and Bogdan Teodorescu is part of our four week literature festival Romania Rocks, brought to you by the Romanian Cultural Institute in London, the RCI, and the European Literature Network, ELNET. The idea behind Rock Talks is to bring together some of Romania's greatest living writers with their equally brilliant British counterparts. Writers we think have something in common, even though they may never have met and come from completely different cultures. The conversations so far have been simply remarkable. David Mitchell met with Andre Codrescu. Paul Bailey was in conversation with Maria Schivu. Fiona Sampson with Anna Blandiana. Next week, Deborah Levy, Elif Shafak and Ben Okri will meet their Romanian equals. The other remarkable aspect about this festival is that all our events are free. We film everything too, so that you can watch them again on YouTube, thanks to London Video Stories. You can purchase Ian's and Bogdan's books through our dedicated independent booksellers, see the details on our websites, and you can download a free copy of the first ever magazine of Romanian prose and poetry in English, the Romanian Riveter. Tonight's Rock Talk lasts one hour. If you have any questions for Ian and Bogdan, please submit them before then via your Facebook chat stream. I'll choose the best questions at the end. Now we're so pleased to have you all with us wherever you are in the world, but I'm especially pleased to welcome Ian Rankin and Bogdan Terorescu joining me from Bucharest and from Edinburgh. And I think it's probably Bogdan in Bucharest and Ian in Edinburgh, unless you have in fact been to each other's cities. Ian, have you been to Bucharest? No, it's, uh, it's, it's one of the many, many cities around the world that I've not yet visited. Um, and of course this year has been a complete write-off for book tours so and festivals, in fact. So, um, no, I would like to, um, and I'm, you know, I, I couldn't even point to it on a map because my geography is just so bad, so terrible. Um, so now I'm looking forward to learning something about Bucharest and Romania, uh, culture, crime, uh, food, drink, who knows? I, I'm, I'm looking forward to whatever Bogdan's going to tell me. Well, funnily uh -huh. enough, Bogdan has written about all of those in this in this novel, uh, Sword, which um, which is just published in English. Now, Bogdan, you are just outside Bucharest, I think, is that right? Yes. Now, tell me, I mean, the reason I start off with these, these conversations, trying to think of what both of you have in common a little bit, and then we see, you know, how it goes from there. And you're both roughly the same age. You're both about 60. Um, happy belated 60th birthday, actually, Ian. I think it was this summer, wasn't it? You, you yeah. turned 60. Must have been an interesting birthday in a pandemic. Um, I'll ask you about that later. You're both very prolific writers. Um, you're both obviously fascinated by crime and society and politics, um, and probably as interested in the psychology of the criminals and the protagonists as you are in the actual crime. Um, I think that goes without saying. And you've both just published new novels. So Ian's A Song for the Dark Times has come out this month, just out this month. And it is absolutely wonderful. I've got it here. Um, and I'm sure everybody recognised the title as um, it's a quote from Brecht, Bertolt Brecht, and it's 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 wonderful. Of course, it is. We've read every single Rebus novel in this household, so um, we don't have all of them because so many people have borrowed them, but um, we do have them, um, and we have read them. And um, and Sword, which is Bogdan's first novel in English, and it's a political thriller. Really, it's not a crime novel as such. So I'm going to start off this conversation with the immortal words, Tartan Noir meets Romanian Noir. Um, welcome to both of you. Um, first of all, I know there is such a thing as Tartan Noir and you are the so-called king of Idian, but Romanian Noir, Bogdan, is there really such a thing? I uh, thank you very much for your invitation. This is the, the beginning and uh, to ask to a question which you never put me. Yes, I was in Edinburgh <laughs> two, two years ago, that. and I had you and I had that a, question. Well remembered. <laughs> I had a perfect time there. Six days in Edinburgh was a perfect holiday, uh, and a lot of good things to eat, a lot of things, good things to drink, and a lot of very nice things to see in in the city and in an entire Scotland. I stay in Scotland almost one month. 
to visit all the small island and all the good places on some islands. Okay, uh, talking about noir, I'm. I like to say one thing uh, that in Romania everything is noir. It only you must take a closer look. That means it's not only noir as a piece of literature. It's noir as a meaning of existence. That's why my novels, I'm, uh, my noir novels, are not about essentially crimes and criminals, but about society and about politicians and about the, their victims, not the victims of the criminals, but the victims of politics, you know, as the singer Manu Chao said, politic, politic kills. Yes, it kills, and it's not killing like a criminal. It's more sophisticated and more elaborated. That's why the noir is bigger than a simple uh, thing you are, you are keeping in, uh, let's say, in the classical noir novel. I'm thinking, I'm talking about a noir existence. And that's why I think there is a lot of Romanian noir novels, even they are not considering themselves to be something like that. Your novel, Sword, um, which basically involves, it seems, every single um, member of um, a Romanian government. It is not obviously the Romanian government at the moment, but it's a contemporary political thriller involving the media, um, um, political analysts such as yourself. I mean, you're a journalist and political analyst and professor of marketing and polling um, by profession. So I imagine there's a bit of you in every single person in that novel. Um, there's no one character, is there? In, there's no one, you know, there's not, there's not a Rebus character. There's not a... Um, no, I'm not interested in... Um in this kind of bright characters, in this kind of beacons of light in a sea of darkness. As a matter of fact, I'm interested in the darkness, in the, in the big masses which are obeying under the rule of, of a government or of a system. The darkness is what is interesting me. And what, this, what, what those masses are doing when they are moving. What is happening in a society in a crisis, not, not only a, as an individual, but what, what is happening when those huge things are clashing, are clashing on the head of the people? And what is very peculiar for my interest and for our Eastern society, Eastern country society, is, is this word we are using for 30 years, transition. We are transition from somewhere to somewhere else, theoretically from dictatorship to democracy, theoretically. Practically, is from somewhere to somewhere else, and this transition is hiding in, it's, it's, in itself everything you need for a noir novel. Everything you need is there. You must. You, you only had to pick a small thing, and you put in the novel, and you have the conflict. You have all the all the all those aspects which are making a classical noir novel. Mm. And it's not in this novel you are talking about the sword. We have some crimes. But as you, told, as you already said, the crimes are not important. Important is how society at every level of each, from president, prime minister, government, secret services, NGOs, media, political analysts, foreign diplomats, how uh, police, how everybody is taking th those crimes and how this turmoil is going in an ethnical conflict with victims generally mm. speaking, innocent victims. Now, I mean, Ian, that doesn't sound at all, apart from, you know, the fact that there, uh, with Rebus, you've got this one central character all the way, nearly all the way through in most of the novels. Um, you're still dealing with every single novel. You're still dealing with a contemporary issue and with how we as individuals, you know, combat this, confront these issues. It's a similar. Yeah, I mean, I was attracted to the, the crime novel um, because I wanted to explore Edinburgh from top to bottom, uh, the rich and the poor, um, the people at the very top of society and the people who've been forgotten about and left behind. I then wanted to use Edinburgh as a microcosm for Scotland as a whole um, to be able to talk about politics and society. And I just found that the crime novel allowed me to write about pretty much anything I wanted to write about. I, it would have an exciting plot, which would keep readers reading, um, but within that you could have big moral questions um, to do with good and evil, you could take on very big themes, 
and you could also explore, you know, contemporary uh, tropes, uh, racism, um, uh, illegal immigration, uh, prostitution, um, pretty much anything and everything can be dealt with in a crime novel. Um, and so, yeah, so I kind of fell into crime fiction almost by accident um, because I thought it was the best way to write the kinds of books I wanted to write. I didn't read crime fiction very much at all until I started writing it. Um, it was only when my books were placed on the crime fiction bookshelf in the bookshops that I began to think maybe I should read some of these people. And I think the first one I picked up was Ruth Rendell because of course she was next to me alphabetically. Um, so I've been gone through all the Ruth Rendell books and I then kept going. And um, to do, to bring us back to noir a little bit, I mean, the, the British, or should I say the English crime novel is thought of as being um, cozy and comfortable an Agatha Christie style, um, perfectly encapsulated mystery in a very closed world of, of privilege, usually um, bloodless killings, et cetera, et cetera. The American crime novel I was much more attracted to, which is seen as being more brutal and bloody and darker, altogether darker in tone. And right from the get-go, the Rebus novels were, were dark. Um, in fact, they've become less dark, I think, in recent years. Maybe I've cheered up a little bit. I was a very sour, grumpy 20-year-old, 25-year-old when I started writing these books. Um, and he was very now, now you're a mellow 60-year-old. I don't think mellow so. 60 -year -old. <laughs> I'm a mellow 60-year-old. And, and I get to hang out with a guy who's not at all mellow, uh, who's in his late 60s, and he's my yeah. character I get to write about. And so I get to explore the world through him. And that's the other thing is that Rebus, um, although there are large casts of characters in all my books, dozens of characters in each book, Rebus kind of holds it all together. I thought this one character, this one person allows me access to everywhere I want to go, every layer of society. He can, he can open a door to that for me. Um, and he's proved very useful, which is why he's stuck around. Well, and, and he, he ages with each book. I mean, the first... Uh... Is it Knots and Crosses, the, the very first book? Um, I, I did find out the date. I can't remember the first time you wrote first Rebus, but it was about 1986, 1987, the first time mm. you, you published that. Yeah. That, I, you know, he's been around. Um, he's <laughs> aging he's, around. he's aging with you. Because I, I, you didn't intend to write more than one, did you? No, no. I mean, the first Rebus book was meant to be the first and last Rebus book, um, Knots and Crosses. Um, very heavily influenced by Robert Louis Stevenson's Jekyll and Hyde. Um, I mean, that's infused in pretty much every crime novel I've written, possibly every crime novel ever written, is this notion of Jekyll and Hyde, what makes good people do bad things. Um, and But nobody got it. I mean, I was doing a PhD, I was doing a doctoral thesis in the novels of Muriel Spark. Um, and in between times, I was writing my own books. And Having published that, I went off and did a spy novel and I did a thriller and I wasn't sure that I would ever come back to Rebus, but my editor suggested that I, he was in, he just said, I like the character, could you do more with him? And it gave me another chance to write more about Edinburgh and to explore Edinburgh a bit more. Um, and yeah, he stuck around and then he retired, they had to retire because he reached retirement age. And of course the challenge for me now is how long can I keep him going? How, how, how credible is it that a man in his mid to late 60s with health issues could become involved in criminal investigations? Um, and so far, I mean, touch wood, so far I've just managed to find ways to do that, hopefully realistically enough to satisfy readers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this one's your 24th Rebus or 24th novel with Rebus in it. And I think that... Um, the, the great thing is that his brain is still working. He may not be physically as well as he was. Um, he's obviously not well. Um, and right at the beginning of the novel, he's just moved downstairs to the flat downstairs. So he's obviously suffering. Um, he's got um, lung problems. Um, but he, his brain is still working. And, and I, could, I can't for a moment think why he wouldn't continue to want to solve crimes. That's what he does with his life, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, he's a detective to his very DNA. And what the, the, the question posed by this new novel, um, because his, his daughter's um, partner has gone missing and the police suspect she might have had something to do with it. The Rebus goes to see his daughter and to help as best he can. But is he traveling there to his daughter's village um, as a detective or as a father? If he starts to suspect she did have something to do with it, a crime has been committed. Will he try and frame someone else? Will he try and put someone else in the frame for the crime to, to protect his daughter? Or will the detective DNA 
take over and you'll end up putting her away in prison. Um, so that was the kind of big moral question when I started to plot the book. Um, and um, another thing was that, you know, it, 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 the, the story revolves around a, an internment camp um, and people who were in that internment camp during World War II. And that was because of some research I'd done. I, I, just was, I just thought it was an extraordinary story, the untold story of these. There were over a thousand of these internment camps dotted around the UK um, during World War II. And suddenly your neighbours, your friends, your shopkeepers, the ice cream seller, the fish and chip shop owner, the German delicatessen owner were all put in these camps because we were told we couldn't trust them. And I just looked around me at the way the world was in the middle of last year and thought we're heading back towards that. What, you know, that, there's something, there's a kind of a binary. It's either it's us and them, friend and enemy. Um, there's no place for nuance or for middle ground. We saw the rise of the far right in many countries and many cultures. We had this idiot in the White House. Um, we had Brexit going to happen all around us. And I just thought, it, it, madness. The world is entering a period of madness. And it felt to me, as it has for a lot of people, a bit like the 1930s. And so you thought the potential for these things to happen is always just around the corner. So I was able to use those um, camps as a way of saying something about the way the world seems to me to be going now, but framing it in the past because they were active for several years in the 1930s and early 40s. No, I mean, it's, it's an fascinating story. And the internment camps, um, you know, they're mostly German um, internees and they, they married um, Scots uh, women later. And, and, and I think that that whole story is fascinating anyway. But then you've got the parallel story as well. You've got Siobhan Clark um, uh, in Edinburgh. So you still you still get Edinburgh, you still get the Edinburgh crime. Yeah, when I started writing it, when I started writing the book, I thought, do I need an Edinburgh connection? Uh, I mean, it's the first time in a long time I've taken Rebus out of Edinburgh for the whole book. We did know um, this. <laughs> it was yeah, a I know. To do. But um, I thought, do I need an Edinburgh story? And um, I, I just went to my big folder of ideas where I keep cuttings, clippings from newspapers, ideas scribbled on bits of paper, all kinds of things. And there, you know, there were some stories in there about uh, Saudi Arabia and mm -hmm. rich people being locked up because they've fallen out with the royal family, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I thought oh, it'd be quite fun to do something with that, with a kind of very entitled, rich Saudi student in Edinburgh who ends up murdered in the wrong part of town, a part of town that his, his lifestyle should never have taken him to. Mm. Um, and as is common when I started a book, I had no idea who killed him or why. Uh, I just worked it out as I went. Yeah, well, and the story, the two, the two stories do come together as well too, because for, for, you know, some of the time you, you wonder how they're going to come together, but they do. Mm. Um, and I really love the the mellow older Rebus. I really, really love him. <laughs> it's just, you know, I couldn't. I just felt for him also with his relationship with his daughter and so on too. Um, no, I long, long may he live. And and Bogdan, the interesting thing I think listening to Ian talk about this is that you do you've you've written different novels. Um, you know, yours is definitely more of a political thriller but you are addressing the same kinds of issues and they're very contemporary issues as well, but still going back to, his, to history, to the historical traumas, if you like, of, of Romania. And that date 1989 um, recurs quite often in your novel, Sword, because that was the, the benchmark, if you like, that's when the revolution happened. Um, now tell us a little bit more about this novel. It's been, um, it's called Sword in, in English. It's been translated by Marina Sophia and it's uh, published by this wonderful new publisher, um, Coriolis Books. Um, now it's about a serial killer who kills all his victims with one stabbing of this sword, that's correct. Yeah? And then, um, and, but he, all his victims are of, of Roma descent, um, which is an, as, as an ethnic minority in Romania. Um, and then there's this whole intrigue involving police, government, media, everyone's under the spotlight um, and there's no detective. <laughs> so, um, but it does tell us about all these different issues all in one novel, in a similar way to what Ian's describing. Taking what, what uh, Ian is saying, I use not a, dete a detective to, to get to different parts of Romanian society, but I use a criminal to take me there. A criminal which we, we never saw in the book. We don't know why he's doing what, what, what he's doing. 
all we know is that what is happening because of his crimes and how every part of this society from the from the top to the bottom it's representing itself in front of those crimes which are very simple they are crimes but they are not you know uh, I, I, I was thinking uh, some years ago when I was in, in, a, in an international panel about crime, I was thinking about a, a famous title of uh, a, rock, a, gro a rock group, the song remains the same. The problem is in all the world, the crimes is the same. It's like mathematics. It's a universal language. Everybody can understand the crime. But if you are going deep inside with, with this in a society, you will see how civilized is that society, how, how powerful is the political class, how moral are the journalists which are treating about this crime, which is simple yeah. as it is. But if we are talking about what it represents, it's not simple at all. And a crime could become everything else. In my case, in, in my novel, it, 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 it transformed itself in an ethnical clash, in a, in a conflict between a majority and a minority with lots of dead persons and a lot of turmoil and another another moment in which politics, media, and all the others are playing again games. Because the essential thing I want to put in, in this novel is that they are not stop playing. They are playing all the time. Yeah. Every crisis, it's a, it's a reason for another crisis, because that's how they keep alive. What I, when I read your novel, and I know Romania reasonably well, and I kept thinking, my God, you are so brave to write this novel. Um, because you have the whole list of characters at the beginning, you know, from the president, the prime minister, the, the minister of the interior, and so on, the, the head of espionage, um, as you call it, I think, and, and so on. And then you've got the, um, you know, a whole long list of characters, and they are all recognizable characters, but they're not the real people. Are you trying to um, make a political point more than in a way you're trying to entertain and distract people? Because, I mean, this is a really strong statement, this novel. Uh, not only in this novel, I have four novels in the same area. We, we, I, I'm not using the same character as uh, Jan is doing with uh, the rebus guy. Uh, <laughs> It was, it was called in the Romanian media a tetralogy of manipulation. I'm, I'm talking about how the things are working behind the closed door, the, behind the closed doors. This is what I want to say, to, to, to develop how, is, how, is, how you are building a nationalist message, how you, are, how you are gaining votes using nationalist fear and nationalist anger and how you are using hate to become a good politician, a, 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 not a good, a, a visible politician. In another book, I'm, I'm talking about how you are using great words like anti-corruption to work for corruption. In another book, I'm, I'm uh, uh, analyzing how you are using uh, intercepting people, big brother, to destroy a common life man only because you can. Not because it's something there, but because you can. You know, it, it was a, a famous joke in Romania before 1989. Who is, who is, the, uh, who is the neighbor with whom uh, USSR will be neighboring? With whom he wants? Mm. You know, because everybody, if you can do something, you will do something. And this is the, this is the message of another, uh, of another no novel of mine. And the last one, which is not translated yet, it's a novel about how we are using immigrants and how you are using crisis in Syria to do again manipulation mm -hmm. and again to, to obtain some advantage in your political speech and your political pressure over the masses. Mm -hmm. All those books are decoding. This, this, is my, this is my purpose. To say, look, this is the way it works. Take a look closer and maybe you will see yourself there. Um, and uh, I mean, the message at the end of the book, um, which you deliver as, you know, as well, it's really poignant that this is a fragile democracy. Um, yes. And you actually use those very words, I think. But that comes over also in the Rebus novels, you know, all the time, this, um, the addressing of contemporary issues, every single novel is illuminating something we're all going through 
as a as a you know as a as as a country, United Kingdom in our case, um, still, um, and you know immigration, um, historical nationalism. You were talking about Ian, um, and Brexit comes up in in this novel as well. And um, Bogdan, you talk about the EU issue for Romania in in Sword, and I mean there's so many things that you know we can read a crime novel. And we know how society operates, really. I think that's been the case for Rebus since the beginning, hasn't it? Yeah, and I mean, more than that, I mean, the, 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 the thriller, the crime novel gives you the complete package. Um, it's almost like a tour guide. It's like, you know, someone who knows a place intimately is going to take you by the hand and show you things that you wouldn't otherwise see um, and reveal secrets that would otherwise stay hidden. So, you know, you'll, you'll find, if I'm going to any country in the world, if I'm visiting any culture, any country, I will try and find the crime novels and the thrillers that are set there, because those will give me a good basis, um, a good understanding of the place. I'll find out what the people are like, um, what they like to eat and drink, um, do they have a sense of humour, uh, what, you know, what's the political situation like. Um, if it's a city, you might find out good places to go and bad places to go, bits of the city to avoid. Um, you, you get all of that. You get this kind of huge travelogue that is kind of wedged in there along with a plot and characters and everything else. And um, I just think, you know, the, the thriller, the crime novel is the complete package. And I, I can't understand why. And I mean, it's something I wanted, did want to ask Bogdan is, is whether um, the noir, I mean, the, the, the crime and the thriller, whether they, these genres are taken seriously as literature in Romania, because in the UK until very recently, they definitely weren't. And even now, I think we're, we're very slow um, to catch on that, in fact, very good writers are using the crime novel and the thriller to say very important things. Uh, the answer is no. We are in the same situation. Uh, it's the mainstream literature and we are somewhere else. But on the other hand, uh, from my point of view, it doesn't matter because I, I think that this, this noir, noir atmosphere, this, uh, this crime matrix, if you want to put it, it's very, very helpful to build up this image of society in, in, the, in the depth of it. Because, you know, uh, I, I will tell you one, one of my favorite quotes, quotas from, from, from Tolstoy, they say, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is different, is unhappy in, in its own way. Hmm. You know, the crime is here. This is the crime. You, are, you can make a particular, a, 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 a peculiar, sorry, a peculiar way of seeing a society through their crimes, because their crimes are specific. Even the crime is the same, as I told you, a, a mathematical language. Every country is dealing with their crimes different. And you have a portrait of a country, especially not by how the murderers are acting, but how the society is talking about the murderers, but how the media is talking about the murderers, how the politics is it's looking at the crime as a phenomenon, and how the people are talking about the murderers. And that's why if you are starting from there, you can, you can make a, 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 a very good uh, cut inside of a society and to see what's inside much easier than, of course, a mainstream novel. I'm not here saying something bad about mainstream novel because there are a lot of beautiful mainstream novels. But I'm sure that in a moment, the crime, the noir, as well as fantasy, as well as science fiction, will gain their place exactly where they must be as, mm -hmm. as a very creative and a very useful way a very creative way to make literature and a very useful way to see and to understand some human reality. That, that's my point of view. And that's why I'm not, I'm not cutting. I'm staying there. Even if it will be, you know, more rewarding to try to get on the other way. No, I, I'm very happy in this area, in this noir area, in this pseudo crime, if you want to say, it, uh, area. Because you have all the possibilities of saying big things in a very easy way to export it to the people. You know, when we talk about uh, detectives, we talk about the detectives. I mean, you both seem to like the American um, 
noir very much. I think you both like James Elroy, for instance. I was, yes. when I was reading, reading that. And I know that um, I know a little bit more about Ian than I do about, about you, just because this is the first time I've read something. But I'm really curious to know um, about the, the role of the detective, because, you know, we have, if you say detective here in a crime, you say Sherlock Holmes, you say Rebus quite often. Um, you know, they, they, they're a very distinctive people. You've got, um, the, as Ian mentioned before, the Agatha Christie style um, of writing. And then you've got the, you know, the harder political thriller. You've got a whole range of crime novels. And I wonder in Romanian literature, do you have that um, tradition of the of the classical detective is is there that kind of figure in Romanian crime writing? Uh, it is a Romanian author. Uh, we, uh, his name is George Arion, who built up a dynasty of this. <laughs> but you must you must take in consideration one thing: before 1989, we were living in a communist country, and, as in any communist country, everything was perfect. There were no crimes. It's impossible to have a, a detective to, to investigate crimes which are not there. Because in a perfect society, you have only perfect peoples, only perfect persons. After 19, 1990, after revolution, of course, this dimension of uh, crime scene moved, especially through translations, a lot of translations, a lot of movies, and the people met with the classical uh, character of this phenomena all over the world. But the problem is that we still do not have this approach to the, to the crime scene in real life. I'm not talking about in literature. Even we have our crimes, we have our problems and so on. We are still more interested in other things, for example, in politics. Mm. That's why I'm 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 uh, I'm using politics as a main part, and after that I'm going a little bit to that to that direction, because we do not have, you know, this heroic I'm putting uh, the heroic uh, detectives, these guys which are fighting the crime as a popular character in Romanian in Romanian uh, public scene. We do not have it. We, we we had it long time ago before wars. Before communists arrived, we had this three or four very important detective in 1930s, 1940s, famous with some good novels about them. But now this scene is a little bit crippled by this lack of character. You know, one of the most famous pre presence of the police in Romanian life was uh, two years ago, I think, 2018, when it was a, a big meeting of anti-governmental meeting, and it was a clash between policemen and uh, and protesters, and the police was, of course, the negative character. This is this is the presence of police in Romanian life, mm -hmm. not as a you know powerful detective who is fighting with mafias and with big uh, um, Russian, Serbian, uh, Arabian, whatever, or Romanian mobsters which are dealing with coke or are dealing with prostitution. Even we have this. If now I'm trying to write a novel about uh, about this problem of uh, of prostitution and of trafficking uh, human being, in, which is a real a real issue in Romania, but you don't have it in in, in, liter in literature. You have only a little bit at news, a little bit, but not as a main target, and that's all. Mm. That's why this those characters, as James Rebus, John Rebus, sorry. Or as a famous, as a famous uh, characters all around the world, they are not. We, we don't have it. Mm. It's, I, I don't. I don't know if, in a very short time, we shall build in the Romanian literature this dynasty of novels with one, two, three, seven, ten, eleven novels about the same character, a policeman who is doing his job. You know, like in Yan novels or like in uh, Scandinavian novels, all those detectives, the sex, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth case of detective Marklund or whatever. No, we don't have this. But do you it's, read that? Do you read those novels though? Do you yes, read? Of course. Yeah. I'm, I'm reading. I'm reading everything which is giving me an image of this social mm. reality. I'm, I'm reading even even science fiction with social components. For do example, you, Neil Gaiman. I'm reading Neil Gaiman because he's giving me this. Yeah, social dimension. I'm, I'm reading China Mirfield with his <laughs> leftish, leftish vision about about world and life. 
because they are giving me this social, even if it's in another society, this social touch of, of, of existence. Neil, um, Ian, you were, you were saying that, um, I, it's funny, I do exactly the same thing. If I go to a different country, I always get a crime novel. Um, if it's in English, I read a few languages, but not enough. Um, and it's, it's actually crime novels have taken me around the world. And, and, and I go with them around the world. And I just wonder when you read um, crime novels from other countries, um, you know, how, how do you think what you do, uh, keeping out the American um, crime novel now or thriller, but um, how do they compare with what you're writing? Do you find detectives in, is there always a detective? Is there always the location, the, you know, the Bucharest, Edinburgh location, the mm -hmm. contemporary uh, stories? What, what do you see? Well what the Scandinavians or the, the successful Scandinavian writers seem to have done is to graft onto their literature um, images from Hollywood movies. So they're more like big, big widescreen Hollywood movies. They've got these larger than life serial killers stalking the streets and very convoluted. Um, and these detectives who are impregnable. Um, in one of Yo Nesbo's books, I think Harry Hurley um, is, is stabbed in the neck and instead of going to hospital, which is what John Rebus would do, he just goes back to his hotel room and stitches himself back up with a sewing kit. <laughs> and I just went, this is ridiculous. It just, it wouldn't, it, it couldn't happen in a real world, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, I try and keep Rebus as, as, as realistic as possible. I mean, I enjoy these books. I enjoy all of them. There's a lot of very good stuff coming out of Scandinavia now. But, and of course, publishers, English language publishers are looking for the next Scandinavia. They're wondering which culture have we not explored yet or which culture could we introduce people to? I think India, um, there's a couple of really good crime writers just coming out of India. Um, well, of course, we've seen Australia recently with Jane Harper. Um, and I think there'll be more Australian crime writers coming along any minute now. Uh, there will be cultures that we I mean, China, I would love to read some Chinese uh, crime fiction, but uh, you know, it is very heavily policed by the government, of course. And so, um, you're only going to get one. You're only going to get one particular kind of image of China from the crime fiction you read at the moment, unless it's written by dissidents who have managed to get out of China. There is a very <coughs> crime, crime, um, crime writer. Um, I think he must have lived in Hong Kong um, most of the time. But yeah, it's, it is interesting. But you know, having um, I'm sure you travel through you know other East European countries, even if you haven't been to Romania, but. I must say, I remember when I went to East Germany being really surprised that East Germans had crime novels because you were talking, um, Bogdan, about, you know, there was no crime in um, under communism in Romania in speech marks. Um, but nevertheless, there were crime writers and there were crime writers throughout Eastern Europe um, in those dark days of the 1980s. And I wonder how somebody like um, George um, Arion, um, got away with it because he was writing very realistic crime novels. Um, I, I, the, the Attack in the Library is the famous one, and that's actually in English, isn't it? How did he get away with it? He was, uh, he was also smart and also courageous. And also he used, you know, a, a small window because the, the, the history of communism is not what you are reading. Of course, the, what you are reading about communism is very important and it's very documented and it's full of big facts. But the reality of the communists is that everybody was, was trying to find a small window where you know you can manage to go through between the rules and between, between all kinds of uh, blockings to, to, to achieve a, a piece of your goal. Mr. Arion had this idea of, of this detective and uh, the stories he wrote about it. In, uh, in Romania, but he, you know, he was, it was a very good politics of, of communist. I put, of, of course, uh, I put it this in, in, in ironic way. They are hiding the, the character, you know, they, they were not forbidding Mr. Arion, but they were hiding under the big masses of classical literature. He was hiding inside, nobody, not, of course, not, not nobody. He was not very, very visible. He was hiding inside of this, you know, these masses. But he was an important, you know, uh, um, uh, an important uh, guy for opening the door for what should be Romanian noir. 
it would be Romanian crime novel. Unfortunately, after 1990, not very many persons went on this way. And I try to give you the, the, the explanation. We don't have yet this approach of this of this uh, of this field of literature. We have more science fiction, more fantasy than we have crime yet. Isn't that interesting, though, Ian? Because it almost makes um, Rebus seem like a luxury. The fact that you know he's been able to continue for so long and be so loved and you know bestsellers every single time. I mean, yeah, but, 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 but. let's wind that back a little bit. I mean, the first seven or eight Rebus novels did no business at all. They didn't hit the bestseller lists. Um, I was scraping a living. I was just about getting by. I was always on the verge of being dumped by my publisher because I wasn't selling enough copies of the books. Mm -hmm. And it took a long time. It was a slow burn. It was it was librarians and bookshop assistants saying to people, have you read this guy? It was word of mouth. Um, and it helped. I think the books got better. So the books were getting better. They were getting better reviews. Then they started to win prizes. And after they started to win prizes, the sales went up. And then because the sales had gone up, the publisher thought, oh, well, maybe we should put a little bit of marketing muscle into the next book, have a proper campaign with adverts and newspapers and things. And then that book maybe went, got into the top 10 or maybe got to number one. But I mean, I, did, I wasn't hitting number one in the UK bestseller lists until Rebus novel number nine or 10. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of people would have given up by then. Yeah. They were, yeah. And, and I, you know, several times I thought, because I'd gone from being a student who was writing crime fiction as a hobby uh, to it being my, my job, to being a full-time writer with two children to support, a wife and two kids. Mm. And so it was important to me that I sold enough copies that we could put food on the table. And a wiser person might have thought, well, this isn't doing it, Ian, you better change, you better try and write some science fiction or horror or something. And, you know, I, I thought of all these things, Rosie, I thought about trying to write romantic literature, romantic fiction under a pseudonym, anything that might sell some books and make me some money. Mm. But when it, when, you know, when success happened, it did happen uh, and, and, it's, and it has been maintained, which is fantastic. Um, but there was a lot of hard lessons in those early days. Um, mm. And I just was stubborn. I just thought, A, I want to keep writing books about Edinburgh. B, I want to keep writing crime fiction. And C, I just like this guy. I, I want to explore the inside of Rebus's head. Um, and the only way I can continue to do that is if I keep writing books about him. So I'm very glad that the world caught up eventually with Rebus. But he is now a dinosaur. I mean, he is the last of that kind of cop. Um, you, you know, you don't, the maverick, mm. uh, you, there's no room for them in the real world of policing these days. And also, I think crime writers, especially in America, who have detectives as their main characters, are being asked big questions by their readers about, about the cops being the good guys. Because a lot of people are looking on social media and they're seeing pictures of cops and video footage of cops in America beating people to a pulp, beating innocent people up, um, attacking protesters attacking people in custody, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And people are saying, you know, how, how can you have a cop as your hero when more and more we're being shown that they're just not heroes? Mm. But of course, you know, with Rebus, you, you're showing that you can. And also, you know, with Siobhan Clark as well, I think she's a great character. Um, yeah, Siobhan's a good character. Malcolm Fox, who she works yeah. with, is, a, is an intriguing character because he's Mr. Goody Two-Shoes and he's never going to break the rules. And he, he likes to suck up to the bosses because he hopes that might get him some advancement. Uh, so, of course, when my gangster figure, Cafferty, um, Rebus is Mr. Hyde, as it were, um, when he's looking for someone to, 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 you know, that he might be able to control a cop, that he might be able to control an influence, he doesn't think Siobhan Clark would go for it. She's learned too much from Rebus. Uh, but Fox, he thinks, Fox has got, there's a kind of, you know, a, a glimmer there. Um, and so in, in the new book, that's kind of what Cafferty does is, is zero in on Malcolm Fox as a potential ally. Mm. Are you going to give her Siobhan Clark her own series? I know you've been asked this much, but I really do need to know that. Are you going to give her her yeah, I mean, I would love to. I would love her to at least have one book where she's the main character. It just, I haven't found a story yet that feels like it's her story. Um, you know, I get a theme I want to explore, I get a plot that allows me to explore that theme, and then I think which character or characters do I need, who will mm -hmm. best help me to tell this story, and so far 
she's not been the answer. Siobhan Clark has not been the answer, but that doesn't mean to say she won't be in the future. Um, never say never. Never no, say never. Indeed. Um, now, Ian, you've had your novels um, televised and, um, and Bogdan, I wonder whether you have a similar um, situation in Romania as well, no. where crime is immediately, crime novels are immediately, not, not that it was immediately televised in Ian's case, but do you have that, do you have that um, juxtaposition of the two, the crime novel and the crime TV series? Uh, we had some TV series in Romania on crime, uh, on crime subjects. Uh, some of them were taken from abroad and adapted to Romania. It was an uh, adaptive series. Did you, uh, have the, that, did you have the Rebus um, TV series? No. No, you haven't had those. No. Well, two, uh, or or I, 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 I didn't see it. I, I, don't, I don't remember. I know the book, but I don't remember the, the TV series. And uh, there are some very popular TV series, but uh, imported. Uh, in Romania, on Netflix or whatever, and there are some Romanian uh, experiences, but from my point of view, they are not, let's say, reflecting what is really happening in Romanian real crime life and the real crime scene and real police and all the connections which are between layers of society talking about this kind of incident, a crime, a burglary or whatever. I'm not. I'm not uh, feeling myself <clears throat> satisfied on this as I'm talking. Uh, as I'm talking. I saw good Romanian movies about uh, other subjects, but not about crimes. There, there are some very good Romanian films, as you say, um, and, and it's fascinating because you know we sort of at the moment um, we're all um, watching so many crime crime programs on television because of you know being at home so much, but. It's uh, there's a, there's a true crime though in Romania, isn't it? You do have the true crime documentaries. I think uh... not essentially. Right. Okay. Not essentially. Even we we had some, for example, last year, in 2019, a little bit before, after some elections and before some other elections, we had a very uh, heavy crime issue in a small city near the Danube, in which uh, two girls were killed by a, a, a man and everything proved to be inside of a network of trafficking girls mm. and it was a very powerful case which ignited all the Romanian society it was a huge debate for all, almost one month of course the police were a negative character and the prosecutors and the police and so on but nothing happened you know, it, it was, it's a very powerful subject. That's why I, I, now I'm, I'm studying and I'm documenting myself for this trafficking issue. Uh, but I, I'm, I saw, you know, movies and uh, nobody took the subject, even it was a very powerful and very interesting for Romanian society. I, I, it's complicated for me to explain why it's happening. But it's, I, I think it's a lack of connections between those two realities. Mm. There is no real interest for crime literature and for crime movies made in Romania, not read in Romania. Because the, the, the Scandinavians are very popular, for example. Yes. Or the Americans or, or, or the movies. I'm not talking about the movies, of course, the, the, the big productions, the thrillers or, or, or the British TV series, the police, the, the crime British TV series or the French one are popular. Now, um, another thing that I'm really, really curious about, and this is something that, as, as you know, Bogdan, in this country, we have so many festivals and, you know, literature festivals. And I know you have, you know, quite a, quite a number of wonderful yes. festivals in, in uh, Romania, and I've been to a few of them. Um, but do you have a crime literature festival? Yes. Oh, you do? Yes. It's, right. made by, uh, it's made by one of my former editors, Bogdan Hrib, uh, somewhere in the middle of the country, in a very beautiful place, uh, somewhere near Brasov. And it's a crime festival every year, which is rather popular. You, you know, the popularity is growing. But it's, it's a, you know, a personal initiative, and now it's they are trying to push it mm. to be bigger and bigger. Well, obviously, Ian, this is where um, you need to go if you go to Romania to... Um, to, it's uh, also a very beautiful place with some very, uh, very good food in that area. It's a very good mixture of food in that area. Sounding very good. And Romanian you've, wine is fantastic too. Do you yeah, miss? You've sold it. You've sold it to me. You've sold it. To me. <laughs> yeah. 
do you miss the festivals and the events, Ian? I mean, you've been, um, this novel, um, A Song for, Dark, for the Dark Times has just come out this month and normally you'd be touring and uh, meeting all of us. And, you know, mm -hmm. I would have seen you in Edinburgh this summer and we didn't meet. Um, do you miss it? Um, I miss several aspects of it. I mean, I, back in March, just as the lockdown was happening because of COVID, I had to cancel a flight to America. I was going to appear on stage with John Grisham uh, mm -hmm. at a festival in his hometown in Virginia. And I've been really looking forward to, you know, appearing on a festival with him. And then, you know, next month I was supposed to be on the Cheltenham Literature Festival at sea, which was going to take place sailing on a Cunard ship between New York and Southampton. Oh, and of wow. course that's also been canceled. Um, so yeah, all the personal, uh, all those have been, and it's kind of, yeah, it's, I've got a lot of writing done. Uh, I mean, because there's nothing else to do, I've written two books so far this year, um, and I might even start a third, who knows, because there's nothing else to do. But yeah, I mean, I miss, I don't miss all the travel so much. It can be very tiring. You know, you're standing up in front of an audience on the west coast of America, jet lagged. Um, it's four in the morning, your time or something, and you're supposed to be witty and engaging and, and charming, and you just want to go to bed. Uh, so and it's a bit of a slog, you know, you're doing a different city every day in America, which means a different flight every day, a different hotel every day. It can wear you down. Um, but I miss meeting fans and mm -hmm. finding out what they like and don't like. And uh, they give me ideas sometimes and they tell me where's a good place to go and eat or where's a good place to go and drink. Um, some of them become friends. Uh, I do miss that. Uh, I miss that a lot. Um, and it's not the same online. It's not the same. I mean, I'm doing a lot of these Zoom type events and book festivals online uh but you're not there's not a signing queue afterwards where people can stop and actually chat to you and hopefully get a book signed and that means a book sold so mm -hmm. that part of it um i'm missing a lot uh i mean this book's done really well i mean it's 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 been it's it's in its fourth week in the top 10 in the uk um and it's been a number one bestseller in canada etc cetera, etc cetera. but you know, the t I think not doing a tour has probably hurt some sales in some places because at a festival, you've got a few hundred people, most of whom will want a signed book from you at the end. Mm. I know. I mean, it's an, interesting, it's an interesting test to see the fact that your book is doing well in spite of, um, you know, the pandemic is, is fantastic news for you and for booksellers and for publishers as well, because, you know, there's got to be a way that we get through this, if, particularly if yeah, it's... I, I, I think publishers, authors and booksellers have all had to make big adjustments to the way they operate. And they have done it. They've done it. They've proved to be very flexible um, and, and swift in their response. You know, my local independent bookshop in Edinburgh during the lockdown would deliver books to your door. If you phoned up and paid with a credit card, they would cycle over with a book and leave it at your door and just give you a phone and say, okay, that's your book outside. Or you could go to the shop and they would leave the book on the doorstep in a bag. Um, you know, publishers had to get there, had to start looking at online uh, marketing because they didn't have any, they didn't have any physical marketing to do. Um, libraries have been closed, which is devastating. I mean, I do a lot of my research still in libraries. I don't trust the internet for research um, most of the time. So the, the books on internment camps that I needed, I got from Edinburgh, central library and luckily i got those just before lockdown happened the libraries are still mostly closed in edinburgh um or starting to close again it's it's uh it's starting to take its toll um i mean it was it was a bit fun for a little while this crisis because edinburgh was empty and so i could go for a walk i put a lot of photographs up on twitter this completely deserted city that would normally be thronged with people especially in the summer no festival uh, nothing happening at the castle. Uh, and it was just extraordinary to walk through Edinburgh going, I can hear birdsong. Normally there's so much traffic you can't hear birdsong and now I can hear birdsong when I go for a walk. Um, but yeah, that's, that wore off a long time ago, that slightly positive note to the pandemic. Um, and all we've got now is just people tired and we're heading into winter with people very tired and very frustrated and falling ill again. Yeah. And getting worse and getting worse. I mean, Bogdan, what is the situation like for you? Um, I mean, were the bookshops open? Were you able to? Were people able to buy books? I mean, your book, for instance, has come to me via, you know, virtually. Basically, I've been able to read it online. I haven't got a physical copy of your book um, in English, but you know, this there there is 
there is a problem, but how was Romania dealing with this? I wrote a book in, uh, in pandemics in one month. I wrote a book of travel. I'm, I'm one of my other kind of literature I'm doing is the travel literature. I have three books already. And last one I, I wrote in pandemics. Uh, it, it's a book about traveling through isolation to be, you know, talking about how you are doing food eating all around the world. I have three stories about Scotland in, uh, in, in this book. Uh, and one of, one of it is about haggis. Uh, I've, I've eaten in uh, witchery in, uh, oh, yeah. in uh, Edinburgh. And as a story is about uh, some very good whiskey, whiskey tasting in uh, Elgin, north, near, near, near Inverness. And uh, those, this book was a very good, it, it was a success in Romania and it was uh, sold online. Exactly <laughs> how, you, how Ian told with the books taken home to the, to the buyer. Mm. <clears throat> I, I finished the book in May and it was on the market exactly where we were still in isolation. I wrote exactly in April, in May it, it appears and it was <clears throat> delivered all the summer. It was, you know, a, an easy book. Uh, and now I, the, 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 the bookshops are still open, I think. Yes, I still open, but I'm using now always the on, online uh, uh, ordering and the book is coming to my home without any problem. We have this service is very good, but I agree with Jan about the changes that are coming in, in our life and in the life of the uh, publishers and in the life of uh, all, the, all those guys in this industry talking about festival, talking about meeting with readers, talking about uh, connection with, with, with the reality. And also I'm, I'm waiting to see for sure the books about pandemics. And I'm talking about the books about what is behind pandemics. I'm not talking about conspiracy theory. I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about how the people, how the people adapted themselves in front of this shock this the uh, our modern self how it works with this this shock and i'm waiting for those books I, i'm trying to write a book about pandemics <clears throat> a, a mixture of uh, you know, of crime and pandemics but uh, i'm i'm sure that it will be a very good experience and a very interesting experience talking about fiction books and non-fiction books about what happens now what what so, is so what is our society in this in this uh, era please now we're coming to to the end. Um, we've had, we've had one question actually, which I'll ask you. And Bogdan, it's basically: are, are any more of your novels going to be um, translated into English? Yes, uh, in, in next year it will be another novel, the second one from the so-called trilogy, the trilogy, the trilogy of uh, of manipulation, is uh, is translated by the same translator. And uh, also, I'm trying to finish this book about a crime in time of pandemics exactly to try to see both this crime, uh, you know, light motive, mm -hmm. but also how a society, a small city, because the, the action is a small city, which is completely closed because of quarantine uh, in the pandemics, how it's happening, you know, a, a city, 5,000 uh, 5, uh, people, one dead person and 5,000 possible, possible killers because the city was closed. Wow. Sounds good. Um, transpose that to Edinburgh, maybe. Um, <laughs> but Ian, you said you've been writing and you've written two um, two books in the pandemic during this time. Um, is is Rebus confronting the pandemic? Is he? Has, oh, you know, um, Rebus Rebus does confront the pandemic, not in a book, but in a, a very short play that I wrote for the National Theatre of Scotland, which is up online. You can see it if you go to their website or you go to YouTube. Great. It's called Rebus Lockdown Blues, and it's basically a monologue. Um, and it's what, because he's got health issues, he's having to isolate during the lockdown. And so Siobhan Clark is bringing his groceries to him and stuff. And they got Brian Cox, the fantastic um, Scottish actor, currently enjoying big success with the TV show Succession. And uh, he was in lockdown in Upper State, New York. And so he dressed his kitchen to look like an Edinburgh uh, tenement. And he did it. He did, so you can see it online. And that, that's, uh, that was a fantastic experience. But that's as much pandemic as I'm planning to write. Really? <laughs> so what There's going to be a whole slew of them and some of them won't be very good. Um, and who, I don't know, I, mean, I wonder who wants to read about 
you know, book set about this pandemic when we've just come out the other side of it. I think maybe some, some, some the dust has to settle. Very wise, but, um, but you, you are right, you're still writing regularly. So um, I, I imagine it'll be almost impossible for authors to avoid writing about the pandemic. I mean, yeah, probably. I mean, it's not as if we can't, if we can go to a pub now and just sort of sit down and, well, thinking, you know, of, of um, Rebus, of course, um, and just sit down and have a nice drink and a chat. Um, even that's going to be affected by, mm. by what's happening. Um, yeah, I'm afraid Rebus's bar, which I'm advertising here on my T-shirt, uh, oh, the Oxford yep. bar, that's, that's where I drink and where Rebus drinks. I don't know if that'll ever reopen because social distancing is impossible in such a small space. So yeah. they're going through some desperate times at the moment. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. I should apologise to everybody that my face might be a little bit blurry. It's because I've got the cheapest laptop computer in Christendom, which has the cheapest camera attached to it. So I do. I always look blurry. I always look this blurry. <laughs> not just us. <laughs> well, look, blurry or not, um, it's hardly been a blurry conversation. It's been absolutely fantastic to get the two of you together. And um, I love the fact that you've never met and, um, and this great conversation has come out of this. And hopefully you two will meet um, in real life. Um, it sounds like the Bogdan Hribs, um Festival in the centre of Romania sounds like the place to meet. The food sounds good, the wine sounds good, um, and... Anyway, Edinburgh is also a very good place to meet, yeah, I'm sure, from the actually. I can't wait to to uh, to bump into Ian Rankin again at Edinburgh Literature Festival, Book, Book Festival. Um, thank you so much to both of you uh, for doing this with us, and uh, yeah, everybody buy their books. You can buy the books online um, from our independent bookshops, or you can buy them at real bookshops. Um, these two are very, very real guys. They're amazing guys. And thank you, Ian Rankin and Ogdan Teodorescu. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.